<laughs> All right, so let's keep motor along. Uh, let's see, let me go back to screen share here. All right. So here we go. Let's do a couple, a couple little examples. So give this a read. Fifty thousand dollar increase. TV ad budget brings in a thousand new customers. Revenue fit into the decision. Well, it depends on if you're typically a ten dollar plate per plate restaurant. It's not worth that cost. Okay. Because it costs you fifty dollars to get that person in the door, and they're only going to spend ten dollars. Okay. So the, the revenue needs to it, well match or exceed. Right. Your customer. Good. Good. Yeah, and that's the main thing is that you're. And it's your additional revenue, right? Your additional revenue needs to at least be as much as your additional cost um, if you decide to go with that one. All right. Um, what you just said. So royalty rates versus fixed fee. the lay of the land down here. So you got two bids, 100 trees on your land, $150 tree or $15,000 for the right to harvest. Your tract of land has 80% pine, 20% Any questions on those details so far? So which offer should you accept? Which would be the better route to go? $150 a tree or $15,000 for the right to harvest all of the trees? A. A? Why do you say that? No. Somebody likes B. Somebody likes A. We got a battle. I would choose A because we're talking about effort here. And the fifth, if, if I know I'm going to get a certain amount of money, I'm going to, it wouldn't harvest all the trees. Okay. Um, but if I get $150 per tree, I would harvest all 100 trees because I want that as much money as I can get. All right. Does everybody agree with that? I heard dissenting opinion. Okay, so how does it math out? Same. The same, right? 100 trees, 150 a tree, 100 times 150 is 15,000, or do I take the 15,000 flat? So it's kind of even Steven that way. So what's likely to happen if you engage with the A plan? Okay, why? Okay. So they lose the fifty dollars and harvest the Okay. So if we give them that contract, will they harvest all hundred? You're saying no. So which is the better contract? B. Right? B gets you the all the average of a hundred per tree um, all the way through, whereas the hundred and fifty is not going to get it to you. So you got to be careful on how you set up the contracts. Is everybody seeing that? So you said it pretty nicely. I just want to make sure everybody's 
everybody's there. Somebody's going to come out. If you do the 150 a tree, they're going to carve off all the all the pines and just leave you with the with the scrap. Good. Is is the is each tree worth 200 dollars, or is the 80 percent all of them are worth? 80% pines are what you want to ask. Right. So your tract of land has 80% pines, and those are worth 200 bucks. 20% of them are fur, though. And those are worth 100. What I'm asking is I guess I don't know if it's a silly question, but is it 200 co collectively for the 80 for all 80% of the pines? No, it's each one, each tree. Each tree. Yeah. Each tree. So if we if we calculated the total revenue, we'd take 80 trees, 80 times 200 plus 20 times 100 would be your total revenue that you'd be looking to get. But if you set up the contract on a per tree basis, then at the margin, they don't have any incentive to harvest those last ones. So what we're doing now is kind of thinking strategically about us being on the receiving end of a contract and trying to put our minds in with them depending on how we structure it, right? So how would we do it? We're going to assume that the people we hire are rational and they're going to look at the economics behind this and make that same decision. And so we're not going to get ourselves involved with that type of a contract. Uh, because we can now make the prediction that it's not going to work out the way we intended it would work out. Because we were dealing at the average rather than at the margin. Now, at the beginning of the contract, it's the same, though, right? So now the person who's harvesting, it still looks good to them to do the $15,000 contract. The B contract looks fine to them. If they do all their numbers, it still works out that they make a profit. But they're not allowed to make that, to kind of skim the till. They have to take the, the bad with the good. All right, any other comments, questions there? OK, how about sales? Expected sales, 100 units at $10,000 a unit. We got a, maybe a car salesman or something. So we got a million dollars worth of sales. Option one, a 10% commission. Option two, a 5% commission plus a $50,000 salary. Is this the term like employee or employer? Uh, employer employee relationship. Yes. So that's the commission we're paying for our employee. Okay. So well, I'm asking you what you Yeah. So you, as the employer, which one, do you, which one would you choose? Option one or option two? As the employer who offers my employee. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. <coughs> So what are the pros and cons of, of each setup? The con of option two is you have to give me fifty thousand of the tree that you can't sell it. Okay, good. Can so you presume that salesperson has considered a sunk cost that they're gonna get that regardless of how hard they work, so they're not gonna work for that fifty thousand dollars. Okay. So for each additional car, they really only have this on the line, because this yeah. is automatic. So like if, if I'm looking at it and I, I already got my $50,000, that's kind of irrelevant, I guess, at this point. And if I, somebody comes in and I'm going to sell a car, if I need to sell a car to them, if I get 10% commission, I'm going to work hard to sell a car with a very 5% commission. Okay, good. Okay, for uh, option one. Yeah. Okay. So that gives them more upside potentially, right? So maybe they're um, they're not feeling quite so capped on what their expected income could be. Good. Well, that and if we're dealing like with the car dealership, you're gonna try to push the ones that are higher price if they're gonna. Okay. Be able to pay it, so. All right. Any negatives to? Option one versus option two, or vice versa. I guess you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned a couple negatives here, but on the all commission route versus versus this, which one, which one gets us the right kind of employee? I mean, if if you're an employer, which one attracts the best employee? It's kind of tough. I, I would make an argument for both. Of those. 
attract the best salesman option one. option one right so that, that's one way to think about it is if you're on the market and there's a there's a lot of people out there and if you throw out the 10% commission the people who are willing to take that are the people who are pretty confident that yeah I'm gonna sell of course I can sell ice to an Eskimo right <laughs> so that's another way of looking at it you know, and it might depend on the current job market and the job conditions too of whether you're getting the right person and maybe it's the right person for your company. Um, but these are the types of things that you gotta, gotta be thinking about because you might also miss out on a, on a solid person who has a couple kids and they just got to know that they're gonna have a base salary of some amount. And so a lot of companies have some mix in between here, but that's the variable that you play with is to think, Okay, I'm expecting to be able to sell 100 units. Do I, if I lower the salary, I can raise the commission, right? It's a variable that we can play with to kind of figure out what we think is the optimal way to design our, our salary package. Okay, anything else on that one? All right. So have you guys had any examples of um, uh, commissions? Have you guys ever worked a commission job? Has anybody ever been in that type of situation? Nobody, huh? I have at least no, one person. Like I've never worked commission, but okay. I've so you had a bonus type arrangement where if there was profits, then they would share. What type of job was that at? Okay, so they shared, they did some sort of profit sharing arrangement with the employees. Did it end up being any significant amount of money or just I a mean, little bit? I mean, I every little bit's kind of nice. I mean, it didn't happen a lot, but that's not the only thing we did. We also, you know, rented things. It was a kind of oh. convenience store. It was a, a marina and a small oh, shop. Oh, okay. You're, everything. Okay. Um, so if I sold or particip participated in selling a boat, if I, like, got the customer to go to my boss and say, I want to buy a boat. Yeah. Did you ever end up getting one of those or yeah, not? I, think I worked there for like five years and I think I sold a total of maybe like 10 boats. But it made you bring it up, right? At the cash yeah. register or whatever you were doing. It made yeah. you kind of engage in like a conversation. If anybody said anything about, oh, you know, be, it, you know, if they were renting the boat year after year, like it would make me think like, well, well maybe they want to buy with you. Know? Right. So. Yeah. Good. Yeah, good example. Sounds like your boss had that. In line, and that's that's what it does is it can transform a conversation that your employees have with them, right? By having that type of compensation plan, then all of a sudden you start steering the conversation. Whoa, yeah, I went boating the other weekend. Oh, really? Well, I've always wanted a boat. Oh, really? Well, we just happened to sell them, and there's a special this weekend, and before you know it, you might have something going, right? Okay, good. Is there anybody else with bonus or other example? All right, good. So um, companies knowing that that's the case can kind of come up with some different plans. Let's look at this one. So before we had a flat salary of 75,000. After learning about incentive pay in their MBA class, the CEO changed it to 50,000 plus a third of profits. Profits went up to 1.2 million. Compensation increased from seventy-five thousand a year to one hundred and seventy-seven thousand a year, and we had one happy employee. So, good or bad? Huh? Um, for the employer, 
And we know it, we're pretty sure it's good for the employee, right? So yeah, I'm with you. But for the employer, you know, was it a mistake? Was it too high? Is, it, is that too much or is that about right? And he deserved it. I mean, clearly everything he did was was worth it to get 1.2 million, so we're just profit sharing? I think it was worth it because it was a mistake for the CEO. Okay. Who did that on network so that uh, as the company performs better, okay. he, gets, he gets his share accordingly. So All right. So it's a win win situation. Okay. So yeah, was a third the right number? Was a fourth? What should that one fourth or one third variable be tied to, perhaps? The sales and not the whole company. Sales. Okay, yeah. So if, if we're talking about profits for the whole company, did all the company's profits fall onto this person's shoulder? I mean, everything that they did that year, every decision that they made, that's they're the reason. They might think that, but is that true? Do we know that to be true? No. So what are some other factors that cause profitability to be 1.2 million that year? Other than Mr. CE, or Mr. or Mrs. COO. CEO, COO. <laughs> yeah. So what were some other factors that would have caused profitability? Increase in demand, the economy's good, right? Did that CEO have anything to do with that? No, that was just a general trend of the economy. We were in an upward cycle, right? Maybe the Federal Reserve kept interest rates low and so that car purchases were good if we're talking about cars or houses or something, right? So he had nothing to do with that. So there might be some external circumstances that were contributing to the profit um, margins the way they were. So if we were to design something to try to take that into account, what might this employer do to hedge against this situation? Assuming that this isn't fair, which we don't know, Mohammed. I mean, if, you know, we don't know if maybe this, maybe this person does have a lot to do with the profitability. We don't know that, so we're just talking, right? So, um, but it, assuming that 177 is a little higher than what he what are some structure it? Okay, tied to sales, which, but at this way I wanted to bring your thought process here. In August, what sort of incentives does he have for the rest of the year? Nothing. It's like, screw this. So what might we do then to kind of got the idea of a cap but still give him or her some incentive? Do your best to Well, I'm trying to think of the actual structure of the pay, like the actual formula. Can you lower, so if he got a, a third up to $100,000, and once you get up $100,000, it goes to a fourth, and once you get $125,000, it goes to an eighth. Yeah. Like That's a common thing that you can do, is start to phase down the percentage. So it's like, hey, we're going to likely get you up to 100 really fast. And then, but it, you know, once you get up to 100, you know, there might be, maybe it's just because the economy's booming. Sorry, your cut's going to go down from 33% uh, down to 25%, then down to 10%, then down to 5%. But we're always going to keep you getting a little bit of the juice, not cap it and take it away completely so that you don't have any incentive. But we're not going to let it um, go open throttle. So that's all part of the negotiation process, part of how you structure it. But 
what we're doing differently is thinking about behavior at the margin because the knee-jerk reaction is typically, let's cap it. Oh, that's too high for uh, CEO pay. Boy, the President of the United States better step in and put a cap on CEO pay. There's no way that per any person's worth $750,000 a year. I think all CEOs should be capped at $750,000 a year. What does that do to incentives at the margin? You know, depending on, on the, the structure, should the government be dictating what that is, or should we let the market dictate what it is? What's the market correction for too high of CEO pay? Who's the, where did the outcry come from? How does the market correct it if it's too high? Well, I think the employees of that specific organization would say, hey, you're laying us off or cutting our pay, but you're still getting okay. your vacation. So that might be one area. So there, the employees might voice things. Consumers might avoid that product if they think it's too high or something's not being right. So that's a couple stakeholders that might be in there. Consumers, employees, or I'm sorry, consumers and, who did you say? Yeah, you said employees, okay. Who else? You're missing one big stakeholder. Stakeholder is the general word we use for anybody that's kind of connected to the, to the firm. Who else might not be so happy with the too high of CEO employee? The investors, the shareholders, right? So the actual owners of the company might have a vote and say, screw that, we're gonna change the, we're gonna change the compensation package to something that's, that's more reasonable with the market. And so, I mean, that's the market mechanism kind of correcting. Should baseball players, since you got the KC hat on, you know, is it right for them to make two and a half million a year, 10 million a year, 20 million, you know, whatever? Is that right for any human being to be making that much? Well, let's let the market decide. People vote with their dollars, right? Somebody, as long as we don't have a coercive arrangement again, if somebody's willing to pay it and somebody's willing to receive it and it's a voluntary exchange, I guess it was valuable to somebody, right? Somebody had that value placed on them. so. Then we get into those sorts of discussions. But what's that? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean that that's in that's that's up for debate all the time. Um, I think that the bigger outcry is whether the government should be involved or not. The the corporate argument that has some merit is that shareholders are too distant from the operations of the, of the company. And so the people who run the company, if it's a big enough organization, are able to kind of pass laws in their favor, kind of like what can happen with big government, that all of a sudden politicians can pass laws in their favor or, for, or other companies that give them lots of contributions, right? So, uh, the economics lesson from that is that anytime we have an organization that's getting big where the power is concentrated with few, possibly leads to corruption and, and maybe uh, not having that, that market be able to uh, clear things out as, as easily. And so one of the ways economists approach that, what, would, what we'd call a situation of asymmetric information, is to level the information playing field. So then the government steps in and has the SEC and the Securities and Exchange Commission forces companies to disclose things in certain ways on certain formats so that you can look at company A, B, C, and D and you can kind of reasonably see what their CEO is getting paid where you put your dollar. And so we try to level that playing field of, of information to overcome that. Okay, anything else? All right. So let's see, we talked about that. That was the end of the chapter. All right, so we will move into some chapter five stuff next. Oh, let's see how I get into chapter five. Okay, so now we've got uh, let's see, some present value type stuff to think about. Doesn't that sound fun? 
Alright, so I guess I'll do that. Oops, I didn't do that right. Stop share. Screen share. PowerPoint. I'll get this figured out eventually. screen. There it is. I have to do it again. Oh, I didn't have it highlighted. Stop. Screen share. Select this one. This one. Okay. I will eventually get this. Okay. So we're going to look at investment and rates of return in this, in this chapter and how we calculate uh, and factor in this. So in the summer 2007, we got a 48 unit apartment building. I kind of like this example since I dealt with uh, real estate. The building was 95% occupied, generated 550,000 in annual profit. Investors wanted 15% on their capital. The bank offered a loan to Mr. Matthews of 80% of the purchase price at a rate of 5.5% and an 80% loan to value. Now, is everybody tracking with me on all that data? Absolutely not. Okay, good. Honesty is the best policy. So, let's try to think of some of these uh, figures here. So, 95% occupied, what does that mean? Okay, with what? People doing what? Living there and paying rent, right? So that's the that's the important thing here in terms of our profit equation of P times Q, right? Where we've got total revenue is equal to price times quantity minus our total cost. We're talking about a building that's ninety five percent occupied, five hundred fifty thousand in annual profit. So total revenue minus total cost each year generates $550,000. Investors expect a 15% return on their capital. What does that mean? A 15% return. So if you put 100 bucks into the bank account at People's Bank and they promise they're gonna pay you a 3% return, at the end of the year, how much do you have? 103, right? So you put in $100, they gave you a 3% return, you got three bucks on your 100 bucks, at the end of the year you've got a $3 return on your money, which is a 3% return. So investors expect a 15% return on their capital. Now this is kind of where we start to have a little blending of finance class and, and economics class. So what's meant by capital in this context? The loan, no. What they gave. What they put into it, that's right. So it's how much dough they put into it in this context. And this is where sometimes it can be in different places. So the loan on this thing, if we, let me jump down to here since you brought that up. An 80% loan to value. What do you think that means? For the, from the bank's perspective, they're willing to give you an 80% Loan to value, LTV. That what they think the building's worth, they'll give you 80%. Good. So if they think the building's worth a million dollars, they'll give you $800,000 of a loan, right? So that's kind of their underwriting guidelines, which then brings me back to this question how much capital do the investors have to put in? 20%, 20% 200000 with my million dollar example, right? So you got a million dollar. Building, 800,000 is going to be funded by a bank. You need to have 200,000 of cash put in. That's the investor's capital. So that's kind of the lingo we've got with this problem. All right, so any questions on that so far? So with uh, Mr. Matthews being an investor himself, then, so you're not going to just purchase it and not go through the 
Yes, yeah, he'd be putting in a chunk of that too. So maybe he's got 25,000, but he needs to raise 175,000 from outside investors. Okay, good. Other questions to clarify this one? Heading into the gate. All right. So Mr. Matthews computed the cost of capital as the weighted average of equity and debt. All right, so a few more finance things going on with this one. What's this equation saying? Twenty percent will be for the investors. Okay, so the five point five is what the bank offered, right? So we got five point five for the bank. And we've got 15% is what the investors wanted. So Mr. Matthews is thinking he needs to have a property that's generating a 7.4% rate of return on average in order to meet those obligations. So this is called the WAC, the Weighted Average Cost of Capital. So we just kind of weighted those two interest rates. Now, Mr. Matthews could pay no more than 550,000 divided by 7.4% equals 7.4 million and still break even. Hmm, what's going on with that sentence? What was the 550 grand? Okay, good. That was the annual profit. At a 95% occupancy, good. That was factored into it. And the 7.4 was the weighted cost of capital, the interest rate, or the rate of return that he needed to get on it. And so if he purchased it for 7.4 million, now we can kind of come back to the equation and look at what finance people call a capitalization rate or a cap rate is kind of the cutesy name we put on it. So the way to think about this is pretending like you were paying cash for the property. If you got your checkbook out and wrote a check for $7.4 million dollars if you got your checkbook out, maybe someday one of you guys will be able to get your checkbook out and write a check for cash for 7.4 million bucks. I'm sorry, can you take the screen sharing off? Yep. Thank you. Thank you, yep. Do that anytime here. Okay, there we go. So you write your check out for 7.4 million dollars. How much income are you going to generate off the property? $550,000. Now you paid cash so you don't have any loan, right? So if you paid cash and you didn't have any loan, what is the rate of return on your $7.4 million? How would you calculate that? Okay, close. Oh, okay, you're doing a number of years calculation. So what I want is the rate of return, though. So how would you calculate, and you were, you were kind of, you can carve these numbers out a couple different ways, but I'm looking for the rate of return. So we know that we paid 7.4 million, we had 550,000 worth of profit. What is the rate of return on my $7.4 million investment? What would you do to figure that out? Is up 550 people of uh, 7.4 million times 100. Good. All right. So $550,000 worth of income divided by the price, right? So look at what we're doing now. We're taking the income divided by the price. And if somebody's got a calculator handy, what does that equal? $550,000 divided by 7.4 million. And then, like
like Keith said, uh, multiply times 100 to get the decimal place over to the right spot. What does it equal? 7.4%. Good. I was wondering if somebody was going to pull that up. So if we take this divided by this, we get 7.4%, which is what we had on the screen. right? So we've got the rate of return being the income divided by the purchase price. If you paid cash for the property, you plunk down 7.4 million, you earn 550. If you give the bank $100, and you get $3 in return, what is your interest rate? Three divided by 100 equals 3%. All right, so this is just kind of the basic way that you'd calculate a simple, a simple rate of return, and it's called the capitalization rate. So this, 7.4, using it, this formula the way I've got it would be called the cap rate or capitalization rate. And this is a formula that's kind of common in, in finance and, and real estate sales and, and other things. They, they look at this and they look at other, other variables as well. So income divided by price equals the kind of rate of return. So this would be our generic way of, of writing that. So what they did in that, in that uh, overhead was calculated it backwards and said, hey, if I need to get 7.4% because that's my weighted cost of capital, $550,000 will allow me to pay 15% to my investors and 5.5% to the bank. Right? $550,000 will allow me to do that. Then I will break even with a purchase price of 7.4%. So this is how we might go about thinking about how much to offer on a piece of real estate. Now we might go in offering seven or 6.9 or 6.8 or something lower, but mentally we're kind of thinking about, hey, I need to not pay more than 7.4 million or I'm kind of being dumb, right? Okay, questions on that? All right, so let me go back to the, to the screen share for a sec. Okay, so that's what we did here, is we can play little games with the math, and all I did was slide the, the income divided by this to calculate what price I'm, I'm willing to pay. So just manipulating that uh, formula around. All right, so Mr. Building, which the building was 90% occupied. That 90% generated a $500,000 annual profit. The financial crisis lowered the bank's taste for risk, and the deal was now a 65% loan to value and a rate of 7.5. So interest rates went up, loan to value went down from 80 to 65. And guess what banks do when? the financial crisis happened. Unfortunately, this happened to, to me, too, on either deals that I wanted to do or deals that I had in play. When the financial crisis happened and they want to keep the loan-to-value a little bit lower, guess what they go to their borrowers and ask for? More interest and more money, right? Because the value of the property's actually gone down, which sucks. And then their loan to value actually went down also. So if you've got asset prices falling and loan to value is going down, you can turn yourself upside down pretty fast. And then banks can get a little squeamish and then they want paperwork and, and all kinds of stuff to try to ride out the, out the storm. So these types of risks tend to not be taken into account when we're all drunk on enthusiasm for 10 years, right? When everything's going good 
from 2001, 2002, 2003. Oh, well, we've evolved now. We, we know stuff. We've got financial computers that tell us rates of returns. And, and we know that a house is always something you can put your money into because housing prices are always going up. All right? And so we kind of all start to get this euphoric uh, perception of, of how to make money and how things are bomb proof. And then things that nobody was thinking about happens, the market crashes, and this is the result. So that's kind of a, a financial crisis in a nutshell, 2007, 2008 timeframe of, of what can happen. All right, questions or comments there? I think I got one more bullet here to add. So if we calculate the new cost of capital at these levels, you need a 10% return. The break-even price is now 5.4 million instead of 7.4 million. And so you were in a lot of trouble if you bought at 7.4 prior to the crash, and now afterwards you've got an asset price that's dropped down to 5.4. Okay, any questions or comments? So, if my discount rate's 10%, would I lend to or borrow from someone with a discount rate of 15%? So, discount rate is a new term that we're going to have here. Anybody want to take a stab at what a discount rate? If my discount rate is 10%, would I lend to or borrow from a person with a discount rate of 15%? Lend to. Lend to. Why do you say that? Okay. Okay. So what, what does the discount rate represent? Let me just pause you for a sec. You're on the right track, or you're saying the right things. Discount rate is what to an individual? It would be how much is their debt on the current asset in the future. Okay, and why? Why are they going to get, do they know for sure that they're going to get that? What makes their discount rate 10%? Based on the market, I'd agree with that. And based on what else for a particular individual, if they, if somebody says, ah, oh, I could get 10%. Oh, really? Well, I could get 15%. Where Why? Where, where did those statements come from? Where, he's investing in? where they're investing their money in. So what their opportunity cost is, right? So different individuals have different opportunity costs of funds, depending maybe on what your skill level is in a particular area or the knowledge that you've accumulated if you if you think you've got the latest greatest ipad app or something or if you're just um, a retiree at age 76 your opportunity cost of money is different so when we use the word discount rate i want you to be thinking about your opportunity cost of funds what you could be doing with your money if you weren't doing what you're doing in other words if you put your money out into something what do you expect to get so if my discount rate is 10%, if I have an opportunity cost of 10%, would I lend or borrow, uh, lend to or borrow from someone with a discount rate of 15%? And you're saying you would I think you said lend to. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Does that does that make sense? Who would be the lender? Who would be the borrower? So Clay's hot to trot on some new business that he says, guaranteed I can make 15%. There's just no way it's going to be less than that. I'll probably make 30%, but there's no way I'm making less than 15%. Right? And then I am looking for something, but it seems like the best I can get is 10%. Am I going to end up lending money to Clay or borrowing money from Clay? 
I'm going to borrow money from Clay. It depends how much money you are talking about. Like if he is taking 15% out of those money, they are going to be 10%. Okay. So I have $100,000. And my best opportunities allow me to get 10% on my money. Clay has opportunities that he believes he can get 15% on. So he's soliciting money. If I believe that his deal is golden and that he's guaranteed to make at least that, I'm going to end up putting my funds with Clay. Right? Now, the, the lesson here is to think about how people, how money fly, moves around to the highest valued use, right? So as we start to uncover opportunities or entrepreneurs start to come up with new businesses, there's new things with high rates of return because he's kind of got a monopoly on the deal if it was his brand new deal. And I'm an investor thinking, well, I could put it in the general stock marketing in 10%, but I saw a, uh, what's the website now with Fund My Deal? Um, Kickstart. Kickstart, yeah, the Kickstart thing. So there's, there's things going on in the economy where there could be peer-to-peer -peer lending. And so Clay puts an ad up and I research it and I believe he's got something here. And I'm like, all right, I'm gonna give you my $100,000. So I'm moving my assets that I would have been earning 10%, I'm plowing $100,000 towards an activity that's going to generate 15%. Now I'm made better off because now I'm earning on my $100,000 $15,000 for this year rather than $10,000, right? And that's how we start to add value to the economy by having money surf, uh, through competition and through a market system finding its way to the highest valued use. For given levels of risk, too, and uh, you know this is much more complex than that. But that's one important thing to think about: is that everybody's got different valuations that they place on their investments, depending on if you're uh, age 76, 3. Um, we all here. All right, questions or comments on that? What's in it for the person to whom you are lending your money if? you will get 15%. In this case, if you would get 15%, what do they get out of it? The money. So th they're gonna get, if it's a borrowing situation and he's hoping to get a 20% return on the 100,000, he pays me 15 and he gets to keep five. Right, so that, that, that's kind of the spread. He believes he's got opportunities to pay at least a 15% return on it. And again, he might earn a 30% return. Of course, if it's a lending relationship, then the most I get is 15. But if we have an equity relationship or kind of a hybrid of the two where I give him 100,000, if he hits the jackpot, then he gives me a little bit more interest. Maybe I get 16 or 17 and I have a sharing arrangement with him. But you know, then we could get into, when I say equity relationships, then I'm a part owner of the business too and he might not want me, right? So, we, we're gonna, we'll look more as we go through the semester on debt versus equity financing. If you wanna start up a business, do you go run out and get partners to get your million dollars? Or do you go run to a bank and get 800 of it from the bank and 20% of it from investors? So that's a decision of uh, debt versus equity funding. All right, anything else, Aaron? Okay, so present value. Who remembers that from way back when? And maybe so we kind of went through the whole whack. <clears throat> Time is a critical element in the investment decisions. Net. Does anybody have a? Does anybody have a foggy recollection of net present value? Foggy recollection? Heard the yeah. words net present value, Keith? You've heard of it? Okay. All right. I think it's, uh, it's the value of a certain of an, um, an amount, a, a, an amount in the past. Okay. But an amount in the past would be today if you're accounting for 
or inflation uh, that has occurred over a period of time? Yeah, you can factor in inflation, but you for sure want to at least factor in um, uh, the, the element of time with the discount rate, which can factor in inflation like you're saying. So project one, project two, we're thinking about where to put our money. Which one's better, project one or project two? Project one costs us 100 bucks, so does project two. The first year, project one pays $115. Project two pays 60. The second year, project one pays nothing. Project two pays 60. So the total return here, 115, 60 plus 60 is 120, cost is 120. Which one's the better investment? Project two. Everybody agree with that? It's pretty simple, just add up the numbers. Well, that's where present value comes into play, is that there's a very powerful thing with money today versus money tomorrow. One way to think about it is, what would you rather have if I said I was gonna give you 60 bucks? Would you rather have it next year or two years from now? If I gave you a choice, I said, hey, pick every one, whatever, I don't care, it doesn't matter to me. You want $60 a year from now or $60 two years from now? Sooner the better, right? So sooner the better. So that's the present value of money. We all have that internal thing, that something that we have now. Why is that important to us? Having it now as opposed to later. Okay, there might be some risk involved with it in the later. Let's just say that, it, let's try to take that out of there, but you're absolutely right. There might be some risk that we have to say. Let's say it's risk-free, that it's, you're for sure gonna get 60, you're for sure gonna get 60. I want the benefit of having it. Okay, so we get the benefits of having it now. If we go out and spend it, then I get the things now. So we kind of have that mentality, potentially. But if I'm not gonna spend it, I might invest it, right? And so it, when it's in my control, now I can go out and earn more than just another 60. By the time next year comes around, if I earn a 10% rate of return on my 60, how much do I have after a year? Keep you tuned in here. 66, good. So if I have $60 here and I get a 10% return, I get six bucks on my money. Now what we're really talking about is $66 here versus 60 there, right? So that's how we're, what we're gonna do is put a time value on your money, time value money. So, um, all right, so how do we calculate that? Well, it, it seems like it's always easier for students to move forward rather than backward. So let me give you a, uh, a little bit of work on the board before we calculate this. So, a hundred dollars, let's say you've got a hundred dollar investment right now. And let's just stick with the with the three percent. If you put your money in the bank at three percent, how much do you have a year from now? I know these are little tiny details, but just bear with me. $103. Alright, so we know that we got $103, but let me force you to put your equation goggles on and tell me how you got $103. That one's so simple that we kind of just know it in our gut, but. Okay, so what do I do to help write out an equation here? Tell me how you got it. I'll, if you verbalize it, I'll, I'll kind of write out what you're saying. Okay. Not good enough yet. Okay, so you, you were fine here, that gave you your three bucks, but then you didn't lose your hundred. So all we needed to do with what you said is to add that hundred back in. All right, so that's, that's our, that's our uh, formula. And we can make it a little more fancy, but let me, before we do that, just say, what if I let it ride another year? How much do I have if I let that interest ride again? So I take my 103 and I let it ride. You will have 103 times 3% uh, plus 100. Plus 100. 
100 or 103? 103? We have $106.09. OK, $106.09. All right, so there's the idea of compounding interest, by the way, is that if you let it ride one year, you not only get interest on your 100, but you also get interest on the interest that you earned last year. So you got a little bit of interest. It wasn't much, but you got a little bit of interest on the three bucks also. And that's where that 103 came from. OK, so if we now, through the magic of, of a little bit of math, do some substitution, we might come up with something. So this is 103, right? And so what I'm going to do is substitute this in for that. So if we take that sucker and we go 100, and I might even rearrange it. Well, maybe I'll rearrange it later. But if we take 100, let me, let me do one rearrangement here. Uh, 100 times 1 plus 3%. Tell me if you're seeing this here. So remember, you can factor out something. And then I switch terms on you. But I want you to see this. 100, 100 times 1 is 100. And then it's 100 times 3%. Same thing I got written up here. Is everybody tracking with me on that? All right, so that is equal to 103. So if I take that down here and I substitute it in for here, I've got 100 times 1 plus 3% times 3% plus 103, which is, again, 100 times 1 plus 3% equals 106.09. What can I do with this little ugly thing we've got? I have a, I have a plan where I'm going with this. I'm not doing this just for fun, although it is slightly fun for me, I gotta admit. But um, what can we do with this thing? Good. So you're seeing that common thing here, right? Yeah. So we've got this little creature and this little creature are the same thing. So you want to factor that out, right? Good. Very astute. All right. So if we take 100 times 1 plus the 3%, and then what are we going to do? Times what's left over is 1 plus 3%. I kind of switched around things on you, but if we factor that out, there's still a 1 here. So this is times 1 plus 3%. And then you already were jumping to that conclusion here, equals 106.09. And then what can we compress this down to? 100x times x equals 106. X squared. Yeah, that was the square. I thought I heard you say yeah. it, even. You were, you were jumping to it, which is great. So now we've got 100 times 1 plus the 3% squared equals 106.09. And what we really got is the present value of an amount of money is equal to 1 plus the interest rate time raised to the number of periods that we're doing it is equal to the future value. And this is the most powerful formula in finance, right there. That of money. So, Questions on that? Now, going forward in time seems to be the easy thing, but now that I broke down the math for you, it's easy to go backwards. And that's what discounting means, is that we're going to take a future value and see what it's worth today. That seems to be more important by doing this little simple mathematical maneuver and look at the present value is equal to the future value divided by 1 plus the interest rate raised to the n power. And this is now the present value formula. If there was n, n is 
is the number of uh, years, yeah, the number of time periods that you're li leaving your money at? Okay, questions from anybody there? All right, back to the screen. Now we need to apply this to this formula. <clears throat> so for this example, the company's cost of capital is 14%. We need to discount the future inflows and outflows to compare the initial investment here of 100. So for these two problems, pull out your calculator and calculate the present value. You want to treat each one individually using that formula we just did. This is the future value, right? 115. We're going to bring it back in time so that it's fair to evaluate it compared to the $100 we're giving up today. Kind of talk out loud, work with your neighbor, double check that you've got the right thing going on here. Can you just say that what you just said when you're saying that? Yep. All I will do it again. So, what you want to do is find the present value of this $115 using that formula. Right now, the future value is $115. It is one year into the future, so the time period is one, so that kind of just disappears. One plus the 14%, by the way, it's just going to be 0.14. So one plus 0.14 is 1.14. As soon as you get an answer, shout it out and be proud of it. How much? 100.87. Did anybody else get that? I see some head shaking. OK. And then we do the same thing for the 60. I wanted you all to do one calculation. Shanita, you all right with that? OK, everybody else? So here's your numbers. $115 a year from now at a 14% cost of capital, opportunity cost, is only worth 100 bucks today. All right? So we're taking the future value, we're discounting it by. Now, if I was to take my $100 and invest it at 14%, what would I have a year from now? 114, 115, right? So that's the whole idea here, is if I go future, my opportunity cost is 14%, I'm claiming. So I can put my $100 into it and have 115. So I'm going to do the exact same logic moving backwards by taking the 115 back in time. And so the future value is only worth $100.88. So like you said, a practical example, if I have $100 in the Yeah, so right now we're, so yeah, let's, let's bring back our, our bearings here. The decision at hand is I'm going to invest $100. Should I put it into project one or project two? Project one has this estimated payment schedule. Project two has this estimated payment schedule. Where should I put my money? So the first flow and by the way, you'd square it, right? Because this cash flow is worth two years out. That $60, two years from now, is only worth $46.17. So you kind of see the power of discounting on how fast this can fall off. What is the benefit then, in terms of present value, of getting $60 a year from now, $60 two years from now? It is $98 or so, $99.
meaning I lost $1.20 on my money. Did you really lose $1.20? In what way did you lose a dollar twenty? Yes, you chose that project instead of investing it. So again, if we go backwards, what that's saying is that if I took my hundred dollars and I went forward in time with my fourteen percent, I would have had at least zero dollars here instead of losing one hundred and twenty. I'd still have my money. I would have earned fourteen percent. What is it saying about this investment? What is the rate of return on project one? The fact that it has an 88 cent, not much, but something greater than zero. What does it say about the rate of return of that project relative to 14%? It's a more profitable project. Okay, and so what's its rate of return relative to 14%? Is it higher or lower than 14%? Ooh, we got Keith on the spot here. Keith, higher or lower than 14%? I think it's lower. Lower? Lower? Everybody say lower. All those with lower, raise your hands. All those opposed, <laughs> abstentions. All right, it is higher. Whoa. So project one, <laughs> project one has, so here, here's what we're doing. This might kind of make sense when we come back to the internal rate of return. What we've done is that we're saying that the net present value is 88 cents. So when I calculated these numbers, I used 14%. If this number turns out to be zero, then the present value was equal to my initial investment of 100. Let me, let me show it uh, a little differently here on the board. I think we'll make it a little clearer. Okay, so. <clears throat> Here's your formula for the net present value. The net present value is equal to the present value minus your initial investment. So this is the present value of the future flow. The present value of the future flow. In the problem we just did, the initial investment was 100. And so the present value of the future flow was 88 cents higher than this, which means that, that project generated a rate of return that was a little higher than 14%. That's why it was positive. And so our decision criteria for the net present value is this. So here's your decision criteria for net present value. If net present value is greater than or equal to zero, do it. If net present value is less than zero, don't. got some of you lost. Why is that the decision? If the net, if this equation turns out to be greater than or equal to zero, do it. Otherwise, don't. Okay, and break even in what sense? You're right. This is the kind of the critical point. What it's hinging on. 
already includes that 14%. That 14%, that's right. So it includes that, that's the whole thing was built on your opportunity cost. If you don't do these other sucker projects, how much are you gonna make? I'm gonna make 14%. If I can find a place to earn greater than 14%, do it. If it's something less than 14%, don't, right? So this ends up being a way to calculate whether we should move forward with the project or not. The net present value already includes the opportunity cost. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Because when we did the equation, we divided that was in that was embodied in that interest rate. That's right. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Well, this time I didn't lose my spot. Good. All right. So here it is. Net present value still has accounting profit. All right, so another variable that I just like to mention is the internal rate of return. That solves for I. So if you were to imagine that equation, it was kind of $100 over here is my initial investment, then the first $60 divided by one plus the 14%. Instead, let's just leave that one plus I plus the next $60 divided by one plus I, and then solve for I. Well, it turns out you can't solve for it algebraically because of those, because of those exponents. You can't solve for I with some algebra. And so you have to use a computer that goes through an iterative process or your calculator, and it solves for I. And that is called the internal rate of return. When you solve that equation, so then that project one that had the 88 cent um, net present value, the internal rate of return calculation would spit out to you something like 14.4%. So the internal rate of return equals 14.4%. And so that, that's the relationship, that's why I call it a kind of a close cousin. These two methods are, are kind of one and the same. They're using the same concept of present value. All right, I'd just like to mention that one because you might have saw internal rates of return in previous classes, some of you. Questions there at all? Okay, so you brought up break even. So what do you need to do to cover your cost? So you're thinking about doing a project. At this sales level, profit is zero. So break even. You, who was doing that in your head? you to you were kind of doing break even I heard you say when you took the 550,000 and you flipped it up the the problem you said if I put in seven put you did this I go ahead and blame me. Yeah. <laughs> well you were close to kind of what people look at a break even analysis and so they say how many years and this is a rule of thumb that's not a very good one but CEOs use it all the time how many years will it take me to recapture my money back? So if I plunk out 7.4 million and I have 550,000 per year coming back, it's gonna take me two years to get a million, right? So it's gonna take me about 14 years, probably a little under, to recapture back my 7.4 million. So, so kind of like a car loan. Yeah, yeah, you can kind of think of it as dividing it dividing whatever your payments are or, or something like that on how long it's going to take you to pay back. Now, the thing it ignores that, that makes it kind of a, a dumb rule of thumb is that it, it ignores present value because you're treating 550,000 uh, seven years from now the same as you're treating the 550,000 a year from now. So it's very much a rule of thumb, but a lot of times in business, um, places will want like a two-year payback will kind of be mentally what a CEO might be thinking is I want... As long as I get my money back in two years, then yeah, let's do it. Or, you know, so the, this is just one calculation that you might see with, with the break even. And there's a little bit more sophisticated way to think of it relating to our fixed cost and variable cost equation. So 
here it is. What quantity will I break even at in my production process? So if I have $300,000 of fixed cost, how many units am I going to have to sell to pay back those fixed costs? So it's kind of similar that way. What I'm dividing by is an important thing called the contribution margin. So if I take the price that I'm selling my product at minus the marginal cost per unit. So if I sell these Mountain Dews at $2 and it costs me 50 cents worth of product, my contribution margin is a buck 50 on every do I sell, right? So the contribution margin is a buck 50. And if I have $100,000 worth of cost, how many of these Mountain Dews do I have to sell just to break even, to recapture my fixed cost? That's the idea of a break even quantity. A lot about that. Be a lot of Mountain Dew. You're right. Might have to get into case sales here. All right. So here's a little example. So Nissan's popular truck, the Titan, had two years remaining on redesigning it, would cost four hundred thousand. So do we redesign the Titan, or what? What should we do? The cost of capital is twelve percent, implying that your fixed costs are forty-eight million dollars. Each truck you make fifteen hundred bucks on. The decision to redesign came down to a break-even analysis. So what is that analysis? So I'm giving you the fixed cost. Pull out your calculators. You've got forty-eight million of fixed cost. You've got a contribution margin of fifteen hundred. How many trucks do you got to sell to break even? Thirty-two thousand sounds close. Does everybody get 32? 48 million divided by 1,500. How much? Be brave. We're just sharing answers. It's easy. Shanita, what'd you get? 32,000. Okay, so we got a couple with 32,000. Everybody get 32,000? All right, so do you get the logic of it? If we're gonna, if we're gonna shell out that many, we gotta sell 32,000 trucks is one way to think about the problem. So that didn't seem to work. So Nissan had a 3% market share about 12,000, so it was again kind of a no-brainer. Like once we dug into the numbers and we thought about how they were gonna shake out, we'd need to sell 32,000 to break even. We've got a 3% market share. Is it realistic to think that we're gonna sell that many more? No, so screw it, we're out of here, right? So again, using some of these techniques to um, decide which direction we wanna go. All right, shut down. The shutdown decision uses price rather than quantity. <clears throat> so what we're going to look at is what uh, this textbook calls avoidable costs. And you can also think about these being your variable costs. But they, they break this down into avoidable costs versus, in other words, if we produce nothing, what cost can we avoid? It's kind of like your variable costs, right? If I produce nothing, I don't have to pay my variable costs, but I still do have to pay my fixed costs. And so that decision comes down with your, um, to your variable cost. So let's look at this little thing they call a cost taxonomy. So I've got my total costs that I'm looking at. I've got avoidable and unavoidable. So here's our sum. Can avoid potentially for the shutdown decision. So remember, we're focusing in on the shutdown. Depending on our time frame, what we call a fixed cost may not be fixed depending on the, the time frame we're looking at. So if we're looking at a time frame of three months and I have a one year lease, then the rent is fixed. But if my time frame I'm looking at is the next five years, my lease is a variable cost. 
So in the long run, kind of the, the key thing to remember, all costs are variable. You might want to write All costs are variable in the long run. In other words, nothing's fixed. What generates a fixed cost is some fixed thing. And so as long as our time horizon is far enough out, we can change anything we want. So all costs are variable costs in the long run. All right, so a couple of little quick examples. We'll be getting close to wrapping up here. So fixed cost, $100 a year. Marginal cost, five bucks. Quantity, 100 units. What is our break-even price, given these numbers? What's our break-even price? So we need to get at least this price to break even. Otherwise, it's better to shut down. So marginal cost is five bucks. I'm making a hundred units. There's fixed cost. What's the amount? What's the price I need to? What's the minimum price I need to get to at least be operating? Four hundred, okay. So on a per unit basis, the cost is just five bucks. So were, were you working in some of the fixed cost? Yes. Okay. So I did. Are those uh, are those avoidable? No. No. So we want to leave the fixed cost out of it. So the answer staring you right in the face. I've just got so many numbers. How much? A hundred. So if I make another unit and I'm deciding, should I produce nothing or should I produce something? What's the absolute minimum price? I'd be stupid to produce even the first unit if I wasn't getting at least $5, right? So the marginal cost here is the avoidable cost, right? In other words, if I produce nothing, then I'm still gonna have to pay my fixed cost, but I gotta pay that either way. Now, hopefully I'll get $6 for a price. But I'd be stupid to open my business if price is down at $4. Why? Because I'm going to open it up, I'm going to produce the unit, I'm going to lose a dollar on the unit, and I'm going to have to pay my fixed cost, right? So you're better off in that situation producing nothing. So like up at Iowa State, uh, a lot of bars shut down over the summer. They didn't go out of business, they shut down because 30,000 students up at Iowa State left home for the summer. Not too much bar business. So there was 20 bars in a little tiny area. I'd say half of them shut down for the summer. Again, they didn't go out of business. They just chose to produce nothing. Did they still have to pay their rent? Yes. But it's pretty foolish for them to open up the bar and collect revenues that don't cover their labor and the cost of liquor, right? That's the idea of shutting down, is that you're choosing to produce nothing because you can't cover your avoidable cost. So you need a cost of, or a price of at least $5. All right. Okay, one little one and then we're done here. Um, This is kind of an interesting little example. Give this a, give this a read. I'll, I'll kind of help us work through it. But you give it an initial read first. All right. So every magazine cost 
the buck. You need this fancy printing press for 12 million. So the break even with average cost is seven bucks for the printer, right? For the printer to stay in business. So what would the printer need to get to do this printing business? Well, they need to be assured that they're going to have that because they are screwed if they go out and spend $12 million and don't have a contract in place, right? So they go out and the National Geographic knows that they bought the machine and now the marginal cost is a lot different. Well, what's the cost of the magazine? Well, it's only a buck. Well, wait a second, I bought this $12 million piece of equipment. Well, I don't care. I'll give you three bucks. You're still making two bucks on every magazine. So th this is an important part with contract negotiations and I've seen this happen in the real world where people don't think long term on how the, it was kind of like our tree harvesting example, right? With the pines and the, and the firs. People don't think out beyond what's right in front of them. And so it would be important for this printing company to avoid this post-investment, um, what's called holdup, through using some long-term contracts that they're gonna pay for a certain revenue stream. If it's 12 million bucks, you need to commit to me five years worth of buying these things from me, right? And start, or, or possibly, that company becomes part of National Geographic and they do what's called vertical integration. But you need to address that problem somehow and don't have, don't be subject to a holdup for the, for the business. Woo! I think we're done. Let's call it a night there. <laughs>